LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Dave Gardner, who joins us to discuss his film Growth Busters hooked on growth. This groundbreaking documentary challenges our beliefs linking growth with prosperity and fulfilment. The film explores how our attitudes towards economics, consumption and population growth prevent rational responses to evidence that we've outgrown the planet. In this David vs Goliath story, Dave shares his own personal story of daring to challenge our growth worshipping system. He is rebuked by elected officials who are deacons of the Church of Growth Everlasting, he takes on millionaire real estate developers enriched by public subsidies, and tackles economists who spin pro-growth propaganda. Growthbusters weaves the tale of Dave's efforts to wean his hometown from growth addiction with an examination of the most critical global issues of our time. Interviews with leading thinkers, animation, and humorous skits debunk the grow or die myth. Cultural myths and taboos are exposed and explored. Providing a ray of hope, the film also profiles groups and individuals exploring alternatives and moving the world toward true sustainability. Hello and welcome, Dave Gardner, and thank you very much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, Dave, today we're going to talk about your movie, Growth Busters, Hooked on Growth. Um, Before we dive into that, perhaps you could just give listeners a little bit of your personal background and uh, an overview of the film. Well, my personal background is I'm a professional filmmaker, spent uh, some of my early years producing a public television series here in the United States, but then really most of my adult life was spent helping uh, large companies, Fortune 500 companies that were clients of mine, uh, communicate in some form or fashion using film or video, usually helping them grow their market, uh, grow their investor base, sell more products, uh, uh, basically uh, kind of 180 degrees out of phase with what I'm doing now, which is I have uh, given given that up. It was, it was treating me well, but I decided I needed to do something for my children and the children of the world and, and do something for the planet, and that is bring attention to the fact that we have outgrown the planet and that it's time to embrace the end of growth. It's kind of the opposite of what I was doing for all those big companies. So I produced this film, Growth Busters, Hooked on Growth, uh, with the idea of just bringing attention to, to, to where we are, uh, the fact that the scale of the human enterprise, which is the number of people on the planet, uh, in conjunction with the size of our economy, has, uh, has gotten bigger than the planet can sustainably uh, deal with. Now, you, um, in your local area, Colorado Springs, uh, you ran for public office on a a sort of sustainability end of growth ticket. Uh, Did that come before the film or and and sort of inspire that? Or was it the other way around? It's kind of a mixed bag there. Actually, what happened was uh, right around the uh, the turn of the century, I became uh, locally activated. I started uh, trying to get my own city unhooked from growth. I, I saw that we were uh, that our prosperity strategy for, for the town I live in, which is Colorado Springs, Colorado, our prosperity strategy was to grow. Uh, everyone was convinced that, that if, you, uh, if your city wasn't growing, it was dying. Uh, and yet I saw that we were giving up all kinds of things. We were giving up quality of life. We were giving up, uh, uh, you know, we were having to raise taxes constantly to pay for the costs of growth. Our, our environmental quality was, it was in decline. Uh, we had serious water issues. 
and uh, and yet I did not see us actually getting to the end of the re- of the growth rainbow to claim that pot of gold that everyone thought was at the end of the growth rainbow. So I started uh, advocating in my own community to to you know really do some serious accounting and figure out if if growth was really delivering the goods. I was convinced it was not. Um, but when I when I found out that I was I was really bumping up against brick walls because I was questioning a, a really fundamental belief about the way the world works and I, I wasn't making much progress and that's when I decided to make the film I thought you know Dave you're a filmmaker you ha- have a, a knack for communicating uh, cr- challenging ideas uh, through the medium of film, why not uh, make a film that will educate people and ask the right questions and hopefully find some of the answers? So then I started working on Growth Busters, and I was about halfway through the movie when I decided to to run for office, which was a, you know, that was a tricky decision because it slowed down production of the film. Uh, but I felt like our city was kind of in a state of emer- an emergency. Uh, the uh, the recession had had begun to hit. Uh, house house building had uh, come to a halt, and our town was was hooked on growth. We needed the tax revenue from from new construction just to pay the costs of uh, serving the people who had moved into the houses that were built, you know, two years ago. We had kind of a Ponzi scheme at work, and and I knew that the people running for office were going to say, we just need to, you know, get another hit of that growth of that drug. If we can get back on the growth bandwagon, it will solve all of our problems. And I wanted to make the case for the fact that it had never solved all of our problems. So I took a little bit of a hiatus from the film and ran ran for office. Of course, the calls for return to growth um, are all around us. That's the clarion call line on the, on the political scene and even amongst mainstream economists. Um, but Growth Busters really tackles the, the, the myth that perpetual growth is possible. And when you examine it and break it down, you realize it's actually absurd. But the point in the film is well made that we had growth and prosperity overlapping for long enough, really quite a, a lot of the 20th century. And we have got the two confused. Absolutely, and I, I do hope that the film does, a, if nothing else, does a good job of, of raising awareness of that. You know, we, we've been on a binge, uh, really, for a couple of hundred years, and it was a perfect storm. We uh, we discovered that you know the Europeans discovered the you know this huge continent of untapped resources. Um, you know, granted, we uh, we ended up stealing it from the the indigenous people who occupied it. Uh, which is sad, but but you know there were a lot of resources there for the taking. We discovered those about the same time that we discovered the immense power of fossil fuels, and we developed uh, uh, ma- uh, mass production uh, all, all about the same time, and so it unleashed this incredible century of growth where we we did we figured out ways to improve our lives and and, you know no question about it we improved our lives but but you're right when you say that we confused them we we thought that we needed growth in order to have a good life just because we had a century of of uh, the two happening simultaneously and it's become in my opinion it's become really more powerful this this belief in in the wonders of growth is more powerful than the the biggest religions in the world uh it's more powerful and more ubiquitous than hinduism uh uh christianity uh uh islam you could you could combine you could take all of the people who are following those religions and you wouldn't have as big a mass of disciples as you have the disciples of the Church of Growth Everlasting. Now, the way the system's currently designed, um, it's, it's when you begin to examine the nature of the problems we face across the environment uh, with energy and also in the economy, it's almost like the growth model is perfectly designed to use up all the resources on the earth. That that's what it will do uh, inefficiently or otherwise, and it will not stop until it's plowed through all of those. And certainly uh, there's a, an economics book which I'd recommend to anybody and everybody by a chap called Michael Robotham, and it's called uh, The Grip of Death. And he sets that out, you know, for example, in terms of sustainability, 
you know, we don't make products that can be repaired. We make products that are cheap, that are plastic, that then get tossed into landfill after a year or two, and we keep going like that. So it's almost it's the opposite, not just bad for sustainability and bad for the future, but it's almost like it's perfectly designed to chew up the earth and spit it out. Well, um, I did an interview with a gentleman named Jorgen Randers, who was one, one of the people who participated in the Limits to Growth study at MIT back in the uh, late 1960s, and the results were published in 1972, and he just wrote a book uh, called 2052. I forget the subtitle, but 2052 was the, the main title where he kind of looks at, you know, how, you know, the last 50 years since uh, the Limits to Growth study was released, and he projects out into the future uh, the next 40 years and, and asks the questions about um, what, uh, where are we going? What's it look like? And I'd say if you have any one single takeaway from his book, it is short-termism, is what he calls it. And he says that is going to be our downfall, is that we just don't look that far ahead into the future. And when you, when that happens, it, it happens at the corporate level. Certainly a company that whose number one goal is to uh, to make money for its investors uh, is their goal to make a product that will last forever, that customers never have to come back and buy another one? Unfortunately, uh, too, too often the answer is no. Their goal is to make a product that is uh, cheap, uh, that it's uh, durable enough to, to make the sale, but not so durable that the customer doesn't come back, you know, six months, 12 months, or 24 months to buy another one. And the other side of growth coin is uh, consumption. And I notice it still sticks out uh, like a sore thumb in, with mainstream media commentary on, on the situation we face that we're still referred to you and I as consumers. This is our identity. Uh, we'll get onto this a bit later on uh, in more detail, but basically growth busters outlines how we're basically slaves more than, we're slaves to this consumption, working jobs that we don't like quite often to buy crap that we don't need to run up debts that we now can't pay and that that in itself is not sustainable well that is so well that is so well put and 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 that's what the growth busters movie tries to do is just encourage people to step back and just examine <laughs> their uh, examine our lives examine the system we're in and figure out okay what's working really well and and, and what's not because we are so busy on this treadmill that we rarely feel like we even have time to, to, to question what we've become participants in. And, and we just, it really just started about the middle of the last century, uh, this, this fetish that we have with gross domestic product. Uh, when, we, uh, when we got, uh, when we finished the big uh, stretch of world wars and we, did, we had all this industrial capacity that didn't need to be cranking out tanks and fighter planes, uh, governments were trying to figure out, okay, we need to keep people working and we have all of this industrial capacity what do we do with it and and that was when we became consumers and it became public policy to encourage us to consume it became public policy to uh, to increase gross domestic product that became our report card and uh, it doesn't really tell you a lot about the quality of your life it really more than anything else it tells you how fast we're using up the planet and and we've got this history where you know, for a long time, we managed pretty well to figure out how to deal with the the crises that we created as we started chewing up the planet. We uh, we have managed to innovate our way around a number of the the problems that uh, this high consumption pu public policy created. But that you know that doesn't necessarily mean that we can do that uh, well into the future. Now you'll recall in. Uh the early 70s, um, there were a lot of, was from some of the Club of Rome reports, or the first one I think came out, that's the limits to growth. And there were a lot of think tanks and organizations making predictions about the future. And uh, there was an active movement concerned about peak oil and sustainability in general. Uh, so there was a lot of potential there. And it seemed that uh, it just didn't, it never got off the ground in, in the mainstream the way that it needed to. And it, it fizzled out. And of course, then in the, in the early 80s, we had Reagan, uh, elected as U.S. president and policies on oil and energy and sustainability all got changed, basically, and that really killed it off. So that, that was kind of a moment that was missed there, I think. Oh, definitely. And, and you know, the that, that Reagan era, I, I think, appealed to our, our 
baser instincts. It appealed to our greed. Um, we would all love to think that we can uh, consume with impunity, you know, that we can drive the biggest car that we want, the, the, the status symbol, the suburban, the, the Hummer, uh, whatever, that we can have a, a trophy house, that we can aspire to have bigger and better vacations year after year. You know, we'd all love to believe that we can do that and that it isn't in the process uh, robbing uh, a, a future from, from our kids. Uh, but I really honestly believe that we are better than that. I do believe that we that greed isn't the number one um, mo- motivator in our hearts and, and that uh, we've sort of let greed take over because we've been listening to the economists for, for too long. who have, They've convinced us that, that money is uh, the bottom line for us and that, that, we're, uh, that we're rational actors, but that there are rational acts are... are uh, um, governed by uh, you know what is going to what we think is going to be in our best interest well what's in our best interest financially it doesn't necessarily tie in with what's in our best interest in terms of survival or what's in our best interest if we love our kids and we want them to have good lives so I think this uh, this movement uh, about sustainability ultimately is about getting back in touch with what really counts and that is not what how much money you have in the bank or what your you know what how many status symbols you've uh, accumulated but it is you know are you really enjoying you know your life you know there's this cliche and it's not a cliche but but, but people think of it as a cliche which is no no one ever wishes on their death deathbed no one ever wishes that they'd spent more time at the office uh, well what would you wish when you're on your deathbed i think most people would wish that they had spent more time uh, with their kids, more time with their husband or their wife, more time fishing, more time reading, more time sitting on the porch, just you know breathing clean clean air. Uh, not more. Uh, no one wishes they had had you know more cars in the garage or or uh, you know a, a a vacation home in the in the Rockies and another vacation home in uh, you know in the Caribbean. Uh, those are the kind of things that we've just kind of gotten wrapped up in on this treadmill uh, and and we need to step off this reminds me of a story someone told me once about a a young child learning to play monopoly and getting very very into it and very excited about the idea of getting a second house and a fourth house and a hotel and 10 hotels and this street and that street and at the end of the game feeling that uh, that that they gained something but uh, then one of the adults says "It, it all goes back in the box you don't get to keep it, you know. And when you're in your deathbed, you're reminded it all goes back in the box, you know, the junk and the trinkets. You know, there's a uh, uh, there's a, a seminar that uh, is traveling around the world called Awakening the Dreamer. That's uh, that was developed by the Pachamama Alliance, and I can't recommend that highly enough. I went through that here in town and actually fil- filmed it and was going to include some of it in the film but but it ended up not ending up being in the film but the bottom line of this awakening the dreamer uh, workshop that you can go through is it, it encourages you to examine the unexamined assumptions and it's the unexamined assumptions that keep us on this treadmill uh, it's the fact that we did you know we we assume that uh, that we've got to have a job that we've got to work long hours uh, work through lunch uh, just in order to to survive, and yet you know, when you think about it, if you if you step back and examine the assumptions behind all that, you don't really have to do that. You only have to do that if you've bought into this monopoly game. Uh, you know, if you want to play monopoly and you uh, and you haven't stopped to to ask the question, is uh, you know, is having a boardwalk and park place and and a pile of money on your side of the board is that really what life is about? Uh, if you don't if you don't ask those questions, then you get stuck. Uh, you become a consumer, and you become a slave to a system that really isn't making us happier. No, and we claim things and aspire to things that are less. You know, we say things that we that we mean the complete opposite, and we aspire to things that we we don't really want if we examine it. I mean, for example, people will say, you know, I, I need a job. Uh, okay, well maybe you need a job, but what do you need the job for? Obviously, you know, food on the table. A roof over your head and what have you but basically as far as wanting a job nobody wants a job if they really ask you know ask themselves honestly 
there's things that people like to do with their time, but nobody wants a job in that sense. Um, it's almost like, well, we put on the earth, you know, to, to have jobs. And you look at what, I mean, there's some interesting stuff I read in a book by a chap called Jeremy Rifkin, which is called The End of Work. And uh, it was talking about the future and uh, there'll be millions of unemployed as technological unemployment, you know, put people out of jobs. And uh, well, what were we supposed to be doing then? You know, because I thought we were supposed to be sitting in the park and reading poetry and drinking wine, not queuing up for a government handout. I just, we just seem to have designed a system that's that doesn't serve us. You know, whether we're in work or whether we're out of work, it seems that we, we lose. That's very true. Now, there are some people who believe that having meaningful work is, uh, you know, a part of the hum human uh, psych psychological need. And, and there may be some truth to that. I think we do want to have meaning in our lives, but it doesn't necessarily have to come from, from work or a job. I'm getting a tremendous amount of uh, life satisfaction from uh, producing this series of Growth Busters movies and, and talking in interviews with uh, uh, with people who, who ask good questions about about the meaning of life and, and speaking uh, at public presentations. Uh, so you could say that that's meaningful work. Uh, it turns out so far that's not really a job. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not drawing a paycheck uh, from doing that. Uh, ultimately, I have to figure out a way to draw a little bit of a paycheck in order to to uh, just to meet my my basic needs, but the but the fact is it's not uh, uh, for most people they they could they could work about half the number of hours that they work and meet their basic needs and turn the other half of the, those work hours into into fun into doing what uh, Mike Nickerson is one of the really smart guys that I interviewed wrote a great book called Life Money and Illusion and I asked him. In our interview, I don't recall whether it made it into the film or not. It may not have. Uh, but I said, well, what do we do uh, if, if we're not busy chasing this, uh, uh, you know, this con consumptive lifestyle? And he said, uh, we pursue the three L's, loving, laughing, and learning. Those are the, the areas where you can get an amazing amount of, of fulfillment in your life. And they don't, uh, you know, they're not really hard on the planet. They, they don't consume a lot. So I encourage people to get unplugged from uh, from that system that require you know that requires them to be on the treadmill 40, 50 hours a day uh, and work half time. Share their job with someone else that helps us to solve the unemployment issue without increasing the load on the planet. But for a lot of people, it, re it does require making some changes in their life before they can even afford to do that because so many of us are leveraged to the hilt now we've got uh we've got house payments car payments uh, uh you know we've signed up for all this stuff that does require us to work a lot so you have to get you have to divest yourself of that you have to get rid of the trophy house uh so that you uh, and, and have a house that uh you know that meets your needs uh, that doesn't require you to spend inordinate sums of money uh, to heat and cool and on property taxes, and you need to, you know, get rid of a couple of cars and uh, and buy a bicycle, and and then suddenly you discover, wow, I can afford to just work 20 hours a week. Well, what interests me more than anything else, three basic questions. Ultimately, it's one question, but uh, why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? We don't have any answers to that. We don't know how life begins. We don't know uh, how the universe came into being. We've got a lot of theories. So the idea that there's nothing for us to do down here, <laughs> apart from go to the office and come back, is nonsense, you know? Well, that's true, yeah. I mean, it's just amazing how much uh, intellectual activity we could engage in, and that is uh, that is very, very low impact. So those are great ideas. Now, the thing is, with regard to, um, you know, job sharing or finding ways to get by with less, which, you know, we're going to be forced to do, but whether, you know, we can choose it, we may be forced to do it, it's happening. Um, we do have an economy of pointless trinkets and kind of uh, activity. It's a sort of economy of stuff and a great many jobs. I th I'm not sure what the figures would be, but I'm sure it must be at least 75 or 80 percent of jobs are actually unnecessary. Uh, in the sense that you could stop doing them and nothing terrible would happen. Uh, so that's another issue. You know, we have created this uh, make work and this constant activity and always doing something. And if we're forced, you know, because of environmental problems, uh, energy issues, or we're forced, forced to start and unwind some of that 
Uh, then I perhaps again go back to Jeremy Rifkin's book at the end of work. We're going to be we're going to have to find ways to live on this planet that doesn't involve all this stuff. Yeah, and you know, you bring up uh, questions that really do highlight the challenge. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily going to be easy because I don't know that I have a a good answer if there if really that high a percentage of the jobs are unnecessary and you may be right about that i think about uh well like all the people who are developing the next iphone <laughs> or the next ipad you know that you know they only have a job if everybody throws away their uh, the gadget that they bought last year and buys a new gadget this year and those are the kind of things that are really fairly unnecessary uh so what do we do with those people and I think the one solution I have uh, is related to peak oil. And I, and I think uh, as we wind down and get out of, uh, figure out how to get on with life without burning fossil fuels, number one, just because uh, the fossil fuels are going to become scarcer and scarcer and therefore more and more expensive. But number two, if we were smart, we would stop burning them today anyway uh, so that we can stop wreaking havoc on the on the climate. Uh, the, it's a few people understand the tremendous power of, uh, of fossil fuels. I mean, they allow us to uh, to do an incredible amounts of, of labor quickly and, and cheaply. And if we have to run the world without them, uh, renewal. The experts that I've looked, listened to and read t tell me that renewable energy isn't going to replace that. Uh, that we, we do have to find ways to scale back as even as we move to renewable energy. So how do we how do we replace that? Well, we replace that with I think with manual labor. I think that uh, we're going to value farmers a lot higher in the future than we have in the past, and that they're going to be doing a lot more work with their hands. Uh, the tractor is going to sit in the in the garage because it's not going to make sense to to fuel it up. And so I think there's a tremendous opportunity there for a lot of jobs, uh, for people to go back to, uh, you know, to harvesting uh, by hand, planting by hand, tilling and tending the, the crops by hand. And that does a couple things. One is it meets one of our most basic needs, which is we've got to feed ourselves. So it's a really valuable and honorable and noble thing to be doing. Uh, but number two, because we do all have to eat and we can't be, uh, cranking out food with fossil fuels anymore. L look at all the jobs that's going to create. I sort of tell young people, if I get into conversations about this, is by all means pursue a vocation if you want to become a doctor or a dentist. Um, you know, just good work there, necessary, always will be. But in terms of non-vocational stuff, don't be afraid to lear learn a skill, learn to do something with your hands. It doesn't have to be menial work. It doesn't have to be badly paid work. And going forward, it could be the single best asset that you have. Sure. And, you know, there's another example that comes to mind, and that's repairing things. Uh, you know, we you know, it's hard to find someone today in your community uh, that can repair something because we've you know, it, we just became cheaper to throw something away and, and to replace it. And it even kind of ticks me off my uh, my espresso machine uh, bit the dust uh, a few months ago, and I and the the company that made it wouldn't uh, wouldn't provide any kind of manuals or instructions to to help me disassemble it so that I could find where the where the problem was and repair it. They just wanted me to buy a new a new machine. But I think uh, the in the future there are going to be fix it shops and fix it clinics uh, coming out of the woodwork because we can't afford to keep throwing things away and making new ones. Now, any discussion of growth going forward inevitably brings us to the issue of population. That's also somewhat tied to notions of perceived prosperity. Uh, we see, for example, now in Russia, couples being paid to have uh, more than one child because they've had a long term population decline over there. And obviously, China, they've had the other the opposite problem. They've been their child limitation policy to try and keep the population in check. But whatever the situation is in particular regions, the issue of population has to be kind of looked at. Uh, absolutely. Uh, there's no question that globally, uh, that globally we're, we're overpopulated now. And some people will argue with you about that. But uh, the, the evidence is really very, very clear. Largely, one of the reasons is because 
people are only going to be willing to scale back their lives to, uh, to a certain extent. Everyone wants to live a good life. And I think everyone should be entitled to live a good life. And so if, if you want to live a good life and you want everyone else on the planet to have that, the opportunity, then it, all, it just stands to reason that there is some maximum uh, number of people that should be on the planet if we want to leave something for the next generation to, to, to live off of. And so all of the evidence is that we've we've uh, overachieved in that department, and otherwise we wouldn't have fisheries decline, climate change, fertile soil depletion, fresh water conflict and crises, and, uh, and a number of there's a number of other things on the report card that tell us that we've overdone it. So um, if we've overdone it on a global scale, then it just stands to reason that each uh, each region, each country, each even each community, ought to be taking some accountability for for their uh, for their footprint, and that means for uh, both their levels of consumption and their level of population. And yet here we are; we have we're so hooked on growth that uh, that there are a number of nations that are uh, implementing financial incentives to encourage higher fertility, or if they're not, if they don't have a fertility acceleration program, then they, then they import people in order to keep their economy growing. Uh, either way, it's, uh, you know, I think it's dehumanizing. It really, we should be disgusted by that because, you know, we're not consumers, taxpayers, laborers first. We're, we're human beings. This is an issue of population can be somewhat controversial. You're, you know, your film doesn't shy away from asking some tough questions in this area and there's many experts have been interviewed talking about this but in particular uh, there's Paul um, Ehrlich he's the Stanford biologist who wrote the population bomb by, back in 1968 and also John Holdren um, he co-authored a book um, Ecoscience Population Resources Environment that was in the late 70s and they do talk about things like enforced population controls including compulsory abortion, adding sterilants to drinking water or food, forced sterilization of women after they give birth to a certain limited designated number of children. And people will find that, some people will find that sort of very dystopian and quite sinister. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that they, they raised those subjects and, and kind of asked questions about whether those were were necessary or not. I, I've never known Paul Ehrlich to to outright advocate for that. But um, but the, certainly the, the growth boosters out there, the people who who want uh, want people to, to not understand the realities of overpopulation and who want people not to limit their family size, have done their best to try to paint uh, these sci some of these scientists as uh, as evil and as you know trying to control your life. But you know I've had a number of conversations with Paul Ehrlich and I think Paul has uh, nothing but our best interests at heart and w and wishes that we could all uh, you know talk about it rationally. And I honestly believe that if we did, if we could get past the taboo on discussing overpopulation, uh, that we could make sure that every couple in the world is well informed. And I honestly believe if they have good information about the state of the planet today, uh, and good information about the implications of their decisions about family size uh, for the quality of life of their kids, that they would voluntarily make what I think is the most loving, compassionate decision they can make, which is to only have uh, one or two children. And if they want to have a larger family, to then, uh, then adopt children rather than add to the load on the planet. Because, because having today... Having uh, conceiving more than one or two children is really a a, a decision that doesn't have does not bode well for for your, the survivability of the planet and the quality of lives of your own kids, let alone the kids all over all over the world. Uh, I believe that we uh, if we expect if we just need to expect more of ourselves. I think we can do it without any kind of course of control measures as long as we let everybody know what the situation is and we and we don't have this self-fulfilling prophecy that says well people will never make uh you know good decisions if, if you don't control them well personally i believe that uh, on both sides of that population debate including you know the extremes at either side 
I think that there might be some misunderstanding really from a lack of proper dialogue. And I think that some who are great believers in human potential um, and going forward, and they do have a sort of a bigger, better, brighter vision of everything for the future, they may be conflating talk of ending growth and consumption with the end of the expansion and, and, and achievement and fulfillment of humanity, but they're not the same things. It goes back to what we were saying earlier that our prosperity isn't just about about growth and about consumption. There's all that, all those other things, arguably much more important, that can go on and we can we can get better at and bigger and brighter. Just it won't necessarily involve a lot of material things. That is so so true. Uh, in in fact, if if we really looked hard at the at the the last two hundred years of history, I think we would find that it wasn't really growth that improved our lives. Gro economic growth especially was just a byproduct of the things that we did to improve our lives. Even uh, population growth was just a byproduct of all of these uh, wonderful innovations. So uh, one of the things I really think we need to do is be careful about how we define innovation and progress. What if the next most innovative thing for humankind to do was to just acknowledge uh, that in, that enough is enough, uh, that more stuff isn't progress, uh, more consumption isn't progress. Progress really is more enlightenment. Actually, having more time to become enlightened—that is uh, the definition of progress that I think we're going to learn to embrace over the next decades. Now, there's something a little technical thing that comes in here that will be ill understood by most people, indeed a lot of, uh, you know, politicians, economists and media commentators. And that's something called the exponential function, which is a mathematical term. And when you apply that to, as you do in the film, to a lot of the situations that we have, you know, in terms of energy and environmental degradation, population, resources, the whole nine yards, it's really a game changer when you factor that in. Well, you know, it's funny. The exponential uh, function is one of the things that people comment most frequently about from the film. The, this uh, segment we have in Growthbusters where uh, Al Bartlett, this, this retired physicist, does a really great job of uh, explaining how if you have uh, bacteria in a bottle and they, uh, and they double uh, in, in population every minute, uh, you know, how long does it take for the bottle to fill up and, and, and at what point is, was the bottle just half full? And, you know, and it turns out that the bottle was just half full one minute before it was full. So you don't really have a lot of, a lot of warning. And, and, and po human population and a lot of other things, even economic growth, actually uh, follow this exponential growth curve. And that's why when you, you know, you can look at any number of graphs, uh, population, uh, economic growth, oil consumption, uh, and they all tend to follow this exponential curve where it looks like uh, it's pretty flat for a long time, but then when it starts to, to rise, the rise is quick. It is astonishingly quick. And, uh, and, and that is why we, you know, 40 or 50 years ago when scientists were warning us that, uh, that we were in danger of overshoot, that we were we were still living sustainably within within our means within the ability of Earth to to meet our needs back in the 1970s early 70s, uh, but they warned us that we were fast approaching the point where we were going to be you know liquidating the planet of its resources in order to to keep supplying our needs if we if we continued at the at the rate we were we were going and sure enough we did we just went shot right through that and here we are. 40, 50 years later, uh, we've done all, very little to, to change our ways because, uh, well, beca because it, uh, we just didn't expect, I guess we, we just didn't expect it to, things to go bad as quickly as they're, as they're going. And in fact, even today, we think we have decades, if not centuries, to, to, to fix the problems that we see. Uh, we, do, we don't have a good appreciation for the fact that we are uh, you know, we are past the point where we could have comfortably uh, made adjustments. So, so now we really are, the, the scientists who pay attention will tell you that we're in a, 
uh, a global crisis. We're, we're in an emergency mode right now. And yet you walk out the door, it doesn't look like it, does it? No, and people have spoken about the current situation, about how it's uh, it's not unprecedented and we've become, you know, it's just a, especially with regards to economics, they talk about the crash of 07, 08 is like, you know, that was just a recession that came along and uh, it's now we're on our, well on our way out of it. And it's, it's going to be business as usual as soon as possible. But we're seeing a lot of confusion in politics and economics, conflicting ideas and policies that show us that we, we, we are in a bit of a mess here. It's, this is, hasn't quite been like this before. For example, you get in here in the UK, uh, the government is being admonished and always talking about creating jobs while simultaneously uh, firing loads of public sector workers. Uh, they're talking about the need to cut the deficit while also proposing to spend £30 billion. Pounds, that's about $45 billion on new high-speed uh, rail network, uh, which, again, that's supposedly going to create jobs, but it's not quite clear how. So there's a lot of stuff that just it doesn't add up. It's not coherent. Absolutely. You're very uh, you're a really keen observer, obviously, of all this stuff. It, it's uh, it's a mess. It's a circus. And the same thing's happening in the United States. And uh, I do honestly believe and I'm not alone that this uh, this great recession is is not just another cycle. It is uh, going to go down in history as the point in time when we really actually did. Finally, uh, we finally overshot the mark in terms of living sustainably so far that the planet really just said sorry game over enough's enough and so we're going to continue to uh you know get little bursts of hope the, the people who use gdp growth as a as a metric for success every now and then it's going to look good to them but we're over the long haul we're we're just not going to be able to get back on that uh, growth bandwagon and i don't know how long it's going to take us uh, before uh, before our public servants, our public officials, the journalists, uh, the people that seem to be, you know, kind of generating the, the news every day before they actually finally realize that we are living through the end of growth. But that's what we're doing. We're living the end of growth right now. And we're really wasting time and resources trying to restore robust growth and, and those are that's time and resources that we could be spent spending trying to figure out okay what's the you know what is how do we live in the era of state sustainability the era of growth is behind us we're now entering the era of living sustainably uh, what does that look like and we're wasting time we're not we're not working hard enough on figuring that out now energy is the lowest common denominator here uh, with regards to growth and everything else, because everything is energy. You know, everything you look at around uh, in, in the room that you're in or whether you're outside, if it isn't naturally occurring like a tree or a stone, then, uh, well, actually, I <laughs> just realized what I'm saying. That still took energy to make that as well. Everything is energy. And we're seeing now that despite uh, all the calls to get back to growth, we're seeing um, problems with supply uh, in some energy sectors Early signs, maybe yet, but you know, don't think that uh, the U.S. you know getting its hands dirty in Africa has got anything to do with helping people. It's saying it's a resource grab, and we're seeing increasing prices for energy, both industrial use of it, right down to consumer uh, energy bills. Do you think that that's going to be the the, the overall game changer? Uh, that it just, it just will become physically impossible to keep on pretending that we're going to you know it's going to be business as usual. Oh, absolutely. I think that's what we're seeing. And it's not just energy, but it's also uh, food, food and water, which are somewhat uh, interchangeable. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that, you know, we've got this huge population in China that are rapidly, rapidly becoming just like us. And they certainly are entitled to, you know, in, in a way, it's unfortunate that uh, we haven't <clears throat> figured out quickly enough that growth isn't necessarily delivering the goods for us. We we got off track. We took a detour and and pursued uh, you know this materialistic con heavy consumption lifestyle, and the rest of the world has been following suit. And uh, now we should be you know we should be admitting oh gee that really doesn't uh, make our lives that good after all. We we kind of got off track. We got on this treadmill that. Uh, that isn't delivering good lives, and we should be telling everyone else in the world, uh, don't make the mistakes we made. Uh, you know, it's almost like a you know a, a convict in in prison. You know, they'll 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 tell they'll tell young kids, 
don't make the mistakes I did. Don't follow a life of crime. I, I regret it. It has not turned out too well. We should be do- telling the people in, you know, in China and the glo- you know, all the global south, we should be saying, don't make the mistakes we did. It, it, it doesn't work out that well. Um, it's hard for us to do because it looks like we're saying, you know, we, you know, we got the good life. You can't have it because it's a threat to our lifestyle. And, and there's some real truth to that. Uh, so, so in order for us to deliver that message, we need to be altering our lifestyle. We need to be correcting the mistakes we made, and we're not, in to a large degree, doing that yet. But, but the the planet, uh, I was really astonished when I interviewed Bill McKibben, the uh, environmental journalist who began the 350.org and has become a real uh, spokesperson out there for the for the climate movement. When I interviewed Bill, Bill said to me. And this was a number of years ago. This was probably four or five years ago. He said, you know, uh, we will we will not have a billion or more Chinese living a North American lifestyle. It, it's not going to happen because the planet just can't survive it. Um, and so what we're experiencing now is some of those Chinese are starting to, to bid against us for fuel, They're, or for oil. They're bidding against us for, for food. And that's uh, creating a lot of the disruption that you see on the planet today. And then, you know, they're entitled to, you know, but the but the competition all, over all those resources, unfortunately, is going to get probably pretty pretty ugly. And uh, the only solution to 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 head some of that off is for uh, the people, the billion people on the planet who are living really well, to figure out a way to scale back and live a good life that doesn't require nearly as much consumption. Now, of course, the, the money system um, aggravates the situation here. It distorts it, uh, resulting in a misallocation of resources. It's a system where short term profit, as you mentioned uh, back near the start, that sort of wins out over any long term vision or planning. And of course, we have a debt based financial system. And that, if you look again at the mechanics of it, that sort of demands perpetual growth to keep it going. We really didn't have time to get into that into the film. Film we just barely gave a nod to that the the, the problem with the way we uh, the way we create money. Uh, Chris Martinson was one of the guys I interviewed who's really smart and enlightened me about that. And I think uh, of all the other things we've talked about, which are all essential parts of figuring out how to live uh, in a in a good and sustainable way in the future, uh, there is that other ingredient that we've got to. Uh, drastically alter the the money system because it does it requires there to be more money in circulation next year than there was this year um there are a lot of good people working on that uh issue and i don't know how we're i I really am not enough of an expert to know how we're gonna get out of that but it is definitely one part of the problem that has to be solved if we're gonna solve the problem entirely tyler durden he had the right idea. Have you seen Fight Club? <laughs> Is that you know, I haven't seen Fight Club. You'll have to enlighten me. Character called Tyler. It's a great film. It's got a great twist. I won't tell you what that is, but there's a character in it called Tyler Durden, and basically what well, he's a bit of an anarchist. And at one point, he comes very, very close to blowing up a central bank building. And the net result of this would be that all financial records, all records of money owned, owed, owned debt, mortgages, Everything to do with financial record keeping would disappear forever at year zero back to the start. <laughs> very, very appealing idea. Yeah, that may be a start. We definitely have to get, get out of this whole idea of, of, loaning, of loaning money into existence. Uh, you know, and that just speaks to, you know, just how we're so enmeshed in, in this growth obsessed system. You know, we, most of us have uh, investments. You know, we've got some kind of a nest egg that we hope will will help us to meet our needs uh, once we stop uh, earning money uh, going going to work. Um, some less than others, and and I and you know I guess that's where being a starving artist to make this series of films, I don't really have very many investments left. So it's easier for me to to say you know we've we've got to stop doing you know doing that. We've got to stop expecting that our money will sit somewhere and and grow. Uh, and I don't know all the answers. I don't know all the answers to that. It's it's very easy to despair in this context when you look at the mainstream media uh, commentary and you look at what politicians or other talking heads are saying on the on, on the TV and the radio. 
and even academia, again, of the mainstream variety. But you'll have uh, really talked to, but you'll, you'll, you'll run into mainstream people in these areas, both in your political life as a well, activism, but also in making these films. What's your sense for where we are in terms of actually getting more of this information being taken on board by by mainstream sort of thinkers and doers? Or are, are we looking at a situation where they're just going to be set aside and bypassed eventually? Well, I see some, you know, some really positive signs. Uh, one that comes to mind right away is that there are, uh, you know, some very well-respected uh, financial gurus who are uh, starting to, to write about the fact that, that they don't expect growth, economic growth to continue, or they expect it to be at a very, very, very reduced rate. I don't know that they have completely figured out that that's, you know, the, the, the long-term f- future, or they may still think it's just for the next decade or two. Uh, so they, they, we've still got some, a ways to go with educating them about the fact that perpetual growth isn't possible. But that does give me, give me some hope when, you know, when you can actually see something in uh, The Economist or in The Wall Street Journal or in, uh, you know, Jeremy Grantham's uh, latest newsletter or something like that that actually starts to, to question uh, the, these unexamined assumptions, uh, like the, the the assumption that growth will go on forever, that gives me hope. But uh, you look at the elected officials. You look at the uh, like in the United States, President Barack Obama just recently reelected, and uh, when in his uh, in his uh, first uh, press conference after he was elected, he actually brings up climate change, which is you know doing something about climate change, which was ignored during the the entire campaign um but he but he at the same time he says you know but we, you know we're not going to do anything about climate change if it threatens economic growth uh that shows you you know here's a a pretty progressive president who uh progressive enough to want to do something about pro- climate change but not progressive enough to to even acknowledge that uh, that economic growth uh you know, does he real does he really believe that you can have economic growth and you can reduce carbon carbon emissions on a planet with a growing population? I guess not. You know, I know he's got a science advisor who understands that, um, but I don't know whether it's a matter of him not understanding it or uh, just having to be politically expedient. But when as long as our elected officials talk like that, it's really hard to have hope for any kind of fast progress. I think it's pretty clear that the people uh, still need to. Uh, we need we need to do a lot of work to give elected officials permission to to tell the truth. Now, one of my favorite moments in the film um, is just to remind people it's a growth busters. It's called uh, was basically when we're talking to having that discourse with people about giving things up, speci- specifically uh, material things, and the idea that their children and grandchildren may have less of this stuff and oh, you know, we won't have three cars, you know, you might be lucky to have a car at all. But the question posed in the film is, giving that stuff up is one thing, but what did we give up to become consumers in the first place? Yeah, that was a great question raised in the film by Mike Nickerson in in Canada. And, uh, and, you know, and I don't know that I've done an adequate job in the the first film, and that really may be where we go with the the next uh, film in the growth busters s- series is is examining that because we do really need to understand that um that growth isn't delivering the goods that we we didn't get it right during the last two centuries uh, there's uh those are such a blip in the in the history of humankind that it's a mistake for us to assume to assume that that we figured it all out, and that the goals of the uh, and objectives of the last two centuries should be the goals and objectives of humankind for for all of our future existence. That that can't be true. So we we definitely need to uh, find ways to help more and more people understand that uh, the good the definition of the good life got hijacked temporarily, and we need to be redefining the good life. It's a good life based on uh, sufficiency. It's a good life based on, uh, how, you know, having our basic needs met and then figuring out, you know, what really does uh, make for a satisfying and fulfilling life. And I guarantee you, it's not having more toys. Two of the things that give me great hope, two of my favorite things at the moment, I'm sure you're aware of them, is that one is the transition movement, 
And uh, in the UK, that takes the form of a number of towns that are uh, looking to become sustainable, self-sustaining, self-contained, a lot of um, stuff done locally and basically be sort of uh, energy uh, self-sufficient as well. The first one was is called Totnes, and that's down in Devon, but there's there are others. That's very, very encouraging to me that that's happening. And I know it's a worldwide movement. And there's also the slow movement, which a lot of people will have heard of. You know, people perhaps who aren't particularly concerned about um, the environment or the energy situation that we're facing. And I love that because it's just, it seems to me to be, just one of the ways that we can move forward with everything that you're talking about and how we can live better by having less, doing less, but the quality of it is better. Absolutely. And I'm thrilled that you brought up uh, transition towns. That is absolutely, I think, the best model I've seen so far out there that is so close to, uh, in fact, it's on the money in, really in terms of figuring out how we're going to live in the future because because one of its you know initial precepts is we don't necessarily have all the answers today. We're on a journey. We're trying, you know, we're asking questions and trying things and trying to figure out how we have a healthy, uh, resilient local economy in the future. And and they have so many parts of it right already because one, they uh, they were driven by trying to figure out how to how to have a low energy economy, and a low energy economy means we're burning less and less fossil fuels, which is good good for for so many reasons and it but it also you tend to consume less when you're using less energy and it's very heavy on localization which i really think is the wave of the future because in a localized economy you're there again you're using less energy you're not shipping goods halfway around the planet to be to be assembled and then shipping them back to be to be purchased uh so they they get so much of it right they're teaching each other skills uh uh, dura durability, sharing tools and knowledge and products. I think those are all of the ways that we're going to learn how to to live light more lightly on the planet. And in the process, we uh, we're kind of getting reengaged in community. We're actually spending more time face to face with with each other, and it's amazing how much joy there is. That 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 is really a big part of what makes the human experience uh, uh, fun and enjoyable is just, you know, spending time with people, having great conversations. And that's one of the things that we've given up in this, uh, uh, getting on this treadmill in service to this growth obsessed economy is, you know, my friends don't have time to go have lunch because they're afraid if they take time for lunch, you know, that they're going to, they're not going to have a job when they come back because they didn't, uh, you know, devote their entire life that day to the to the corporate god. Yeah, well, I think it's good to end on a positive note. And if people are new to either the transition movement or the slow movement, um, I'd urge them to, to check them out because it's it, they don't feel like they're about austerity. They really do feel very positive, and there's a lot of enjoyment being had already by people working on these these projects. Um, now, I know that uh, the Growth Busters project is ongoing, so perhaps. To wrap things up for today, you could tell folks about what's next with that and also where they can see the film, buy it, stream it, whatever, just anything you'd like to share. Great. Yeah, lots of exciting things. Uh, first of all, the film is, uh, you know, it's not likely to be seen. In, you know, it's not going to come to a theater near you unless you bring it to a theater near you. We have a tremendous uh, grassroots support network around the world, uh, anyone can organize a screening of the film and we continue to encourage people to do that and we really give you a lot of support if you if you want to do that we have a screenings coordinator who will help you uh, provide you with materials to publicize the screening we make the film very affordable we don't uh, we don't ask for a lot of money if you want to to, to gather a group of people to see it uh, you can go to you can visit growthbusters.org to uh, one, you can look at the screening schedule and see if the film is going to be showing near you. If it's not, you can uh, click on the organize a screening link and learn about what you need to do to organize a screening of your own. You can order a, a DVD or a Blu-ray copy of the film in, uh, in order to show to friends or to, to your entire community. Or if you're a real private person, you can just order it and watch it in your home. I think we are days away from being able to offer a, 
a digital version online that you can rent or or buy and download, and you don't even have to to have a physical DVD. Uh, so you can watch our website. Uh, the minute the minute that's available, we'll make that uh, very clear on the website how to how to do that. Uh, Let's see, there are also, um, we're also going to have a new program very shortly that you'll find at growthbusters.org where if you, if you want the movie to be brought to an actual movie theater near you, uh, there's a company that we're working with where we'll be able to, uh, to make that possible, uh, where you don't, have to, you don't have to line up the room, you don't have to line up the DVD player and the projector. Uh, the movie theater will do all that for you, but then you definitely have to promote the screening and get people to to actually buy tickets in order to make it worth the, the movie theater's while to do. So those are some of the things. Um, the, uh, also in our future, we're uh, in the early stages of putting together a, a, just a television series that will share the interviews that I did for the film. I interviewed some brilliant people uh, who have really interesting thoughts about the the uh, the history of the world and the future of, of civilization, and uh, you only get to see a couple minutes of of them in the film. So we're going to put together a a series where where you'll each week you'll get a half hour uh, in depth conversation with some of the leading thinkers about sustainability. It may be uh, six months before that's out there on the air, but we're working on that, and we're welcoming people who want to help us accomplish any of these objectives. Uh, we make it pretty easy on the website for you to. Uh, to get in touch with us if you want to volunteer some of your expertise or, uh, or just your, uh, your labor to help us get that done. And uh, we're a nonprofit organization, so we make it easy on the website for people to also make uh, financial contributions to help us accomplish these objectives. Well, Dave, thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. It's been a pleasure. You've asked great questions. Uh, keep up the great work. Well, that's it for another week. As ever, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please check out LegalizeFreedom.com. That's Legalize-Freedom.com, spelled with an S or a Z. And there you'll find an archive of programs on many equally fascinating topics. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com. <laughs>